All right. Maranatha. Christ is coming. Praise the Lord. Somebody's excited about the return of Jesus Christ. Somebody's excited about the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's say it again. Maranatha. Praise the Lord. Amen. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to another presentation of Unveiling Revelation. Your life is about to change forever. Amen. And we are getting into some very heavy topics, right? Praise the Lord for that. Before we begin, remember, seven presentations, you get the final events of Bible Prophecy DVD. Fourteen presentations, you get the Cosmic Conflict DVD. Twenty-one presentations, you get the... Revelation, the bride, the beast, and Babylon. Now, some of you have said, well, I came a little bit halfway, so I'm never going to make it to 21. I won't be able to get that DVD. And I said, do you really think I'm that mean? <laughs> of course not. You come, and you know, of course, we will, right? We want to we give you these things. We want to give you these resources. This is a fascinating, fascinating DVD, that Amazing Facts uh, we just took out last year. So praise the Lord. Let's talk about tomorrow's topics. Tomorrow we have Monday, 7 o'clock, Revelations, Lake of Eternal Fire. Amen. Tomorrow we are going to talk about the second death. Tonight we're going to talk about the first death. Amen? Woo, juicy stuff. You need to come. One of my favorite topics. The question is, what is the lake of fire? Where is the lake of fire? And how long is the lake of fire going to last? Amen? Tuesday, 7 o'clock. The worst of the abominations. The mark. The mark of the beast. Amen? Fascinating stuff. This is, we're going to really see and really see exactly what is going to be happening in the end times and this mark of the beast is going to really mark the, these events we already have half of the equation got, got done because we know who the beast is now it's a matter of figuring out what is his his mark very good fascinating fascinating stuff i'm getting excited Wednesday, 7 o'clock, marriage in the times of Noah. Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 24, my return shall be as it was in the times of Noah, that they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into two fascinating topics. Why were they eating and drinking? What was going on and what was happening with marriage? Well, the eating and drinking part, we're not going to be able to cover, all right? There's some principles that we have covered about that, but remember, Jesus Christ is not talking to the world. He's talking to the, he's talking to the church talking to the church, but what was happening with marriage? I thought marriage, isn't marriage God's plan? Yes, but there was something happening during the times of Noah with marriage. And we have to jump into that because that is one of the things or one of the points that are going to be happening the same time in the church in the end. Is everybody keeping up with me? So I don't know about you, but I want to study it because I want to be paying attention to know what's going to happen before the return of Jesus Christ. Can I hear an Amen. You don't seem excited about knowing these things. Lots and lots of prophecies. It's a fascinating prophecy what we're going to study. On Friday, I'm going to invite you to come in at 6 o'clock. Why? Because on Friday at 6 o'clock, we are going to see a video that confirms the ecumenical agreement with the papacy. This is a video which I explained to you which, that the Pope makes a special invitation to those churches that have not joined the ecumenical movement yet. Right? At least in principle, at least on paper, which are the evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal movement. But we're going to watch a video because then you're going to say, well, Carlos is making this up. No, 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 no. We're going to watch a video that there is their own video. It's their own uh, production and showing how they're saying, let's bring it all together. Let's bring it all together. Let's unite. Let's move forward. We're all, all in love. Right? It's all about love. Well, we're going to see exactly how that's going to be playing out. Then we return after the video, Revelation reveals the bride of Christ. The Bible says that Christ is going to come to bring and pick up his bride. Amen? The question is, who is the bride of Christ? And it's a fascinating, fascinating topic because it's not who you think she is. Ooh. Then we return. Sabbath school, right? We said that we, uh, aside from our Sabbath worship, our regular Sabbath worship, we also have what is called a Sabbath school. And I'm inviting you at 9.30 to come because I am going to give a special Sabbath school lesson. And the topic is, who is the Archangel Michael? Amen? It's a prophetic topic. Michael shows up in Revelation chapter 12 and Daniel chapter 12 and a number of other places. Fascinating. has to do with the end times. And we want to study this topic because it's one of my favorite topics and I love it. So I invite you to come early. All right? Come early on Sabbath with us and join us for this amazing topic. Then we have at 1045 in our worship service, we have Armageddon and the 
seven last plagues of Revelation, right? Those seven last plagues in Revelation we have mentioned and we're going to see on that Sabbath morning, the seven last plagues of Revelation are going to undo the six days of creation in Genesis chapter 1. Whoo! And exactly what is going to happen with the battle of Armageddon in all of this context, we're going to jump in. It is a fascinating, fascinating study, right? We also have this Sabbath. We are going to have uh, this Sabbath, the 31st, and the following them, baptismal ceremony. Now, those are not the only ones, all right? The baptism, church is here to baptize those that want to turn their life over and want to follow Jesus Christ, amen? So these are some. We have already been starting to meet and speak with some of those people that have made that decision, and we are going to continue to do this during this week, amen? So don't worry, don't be afraid. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk as people continue to confirm the commitments that they have wanted to turn their lives over to Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen for that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Then we finish at Saturday at 7 o'clock with the last topic, the millennium and your eternal vacation. We're going to look at uh, the second and third. The last two phases of the heavenly judgment are going to be carried out here. When, when the question is what happens before, what happens during, and what happens after the millennium? Well, we're going to study and we're going to talk on that. We're actually going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Uh, and your eternal vacation. And I like that, eternal vacation. Amen? Everybody wants an eternal vacation. But tonight's topic... I changed, I actually changed the topic today. It was the enemy's greatest lie. I'm saying that it's Babylon's greatest lie revealed because the lie comes from who? From the devil. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessing. We thank you for the guidance, for the love, for the patience, for the mercy that you have for us, Father. We know that we don't deserve anything, that everything that we have been received, that we have received, that we'll receive is thanks to the merits of Jesus Christ. We ask forgiveness for our sins, Father, if in any way we have not lived up to your word or not lived up to the name that we have professed to live by and that you, your Holy Spirit continue to do his wonderful work in us, Father. We are going to cover a fascinating topic, and it is also a quite a difficult topic for many people. But we ask, Father, that you help us and guide us so that we may live by your word, that we may follow Christ in every way and prepare ourselves and prepare others for the soon coming of your Son. Thank you for the blessing, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. As we are continuing with this three angels message in Revelation chapter 14, and we know that that second angel says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, for she has all of the nations drinking of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, right? And Revelation 17 is an extension to that second angel, right? And those that are in Babylon, it says, will receive the... Worship the beast, receive the mark of the beast, and we'll worship the image of the beast. So this extension, of course, and as we remember we said, in 17 is focusing on the religious aspects of this system because this is a system, right? This Babylonian system, specifically speaking about the beast, that has two faces. It has the civil political part of it, and it has the religious part of it. Well, we study the political part and what it's going to do on this earth, in the, especially in the end times, but we're also looking at the religious part of it. Revelation chapter 17, everybody there? Amen? Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great, what? The great harlot who sits on many, many waters, right? The Bible says that there is a great harlot. Now we know that a woman in Bible prophecy represents God's people or God's church. And if she's a harlot, that means she's not being faithful to her to her husband, she's being an adulterous woman, right? But then Revelation 12 speaks about this woman that is what? Clothed with the glory of God, right? As she, she's a woman that is, that is being faithful to God's word, that is following and living by God's principles. But what happens? That Revelation chapter 12 tells us that she is being attacked by, the, by this dragon who is China. Who's the dragon? The devil, the devil is attacking her, and this devil has seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns, right? Because the devil, who was he using? He was using Rome, right? To try to what? To chew up the Messiah, the seed that were to come. And then in Revelation 12, 17, it says that the dragon is making war on the woman, right? The same dragon is making war, attacking the woman in the times of the end. Fascinating that that woman or that harlot is sitting on that beast dragon that has seven heads and... Ten horns. Yay, 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 yay. And my loved ones, this is the battle of Armageddon. This is the battle of Armageddon as we're going to see. The devil making war on the loyal, faithful woman 
with the harlot woman, with the adulterous woman, right? And as we've seen, this has already happened in history. During the 1,260 years, that's exactly what she did. She carried out her war on God's people, right? Is this something new? No, we saw that this is continuing. This has been throughout history. Let's continue to read. The woman sits on many waters. With whom? Now, who is she being adulterous with? With whom the kings of the earth committed what? Fornication. This illicit relationship between the harlot and the kings of the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her? Fornication. So this woman or this church, instead of being loyal to her husband, she is committing adultery. She is doing fornication with the kings of the earth. It's the coming together of church and state. Again, not paying attention to the Bible, bringing this together. And out of this illicit relationship, there has been produced a wine that has the whole world drunk. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman or a church sitting on a scarlet beast, with, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten. I have a question. Who is dominating this relationship, the church or the state? The church, because she's sitting on the beast, right? She is the one in charge. And this has already happened, my loved ones, as we saw in the 1,260 years. And it says that it was a scarlet beast. We know that the scarlet beast, that beast, that fourth beast in Revelation, right, representing Rome, the Roman Empire in its, in its different stages, was full of names of blasphemy. We saw that the name of the papacy is what? Vicarios Filidei, right? The one that is in the place of Christ. Blasphemous names. Having seven heads and ten horns, seven head represents the seven hills, right? The church on top of Rome, on top of seven hills. I mean, prophecy is amazingly accurate. And ten horns representing, right? And we know that they're talking about who? We're talking about the papacy, right? They're talking about the little horn. Remember, my loved ones, we have been very clear about this. We are not talking about Catholics, amen? We are not talking about the people that are in this system because have we seen, 99% of these people are not aware of these things. They don't know these things, right? They are being deceived by their own system. We're talking about the system, about the papacy, about the institution that is anti, anti what? Antichrist. Pope walks around and what do they say? Holy Father. Everybody calls him Holy Father. Your holiness. Holy Father. Jesus is very clear in Matthew 23, 9 when he says, And call no man your father upon the earth. Talking about spiritual father. For one is your father, which is where? And in heaven. But clearly they don't pay attention. They don't listen and follow scripture. Because if they knew what the Bible says, they would not call him Holy Father. Amen? The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand the what? A golden cup full of her abominations and the filthiness of her fornications. Now we saw this, right? In the sense of the colors, the official colors, the cup, the golden cup, the riches of the, of the Vatican. I forgot to tell you, there is a fascinating documentary that you should go see. It's on PBS. And there's a documentary series called Frontline on PBS. If you go there and go into their archives, they have a documentary on Frontline PBS called The Secrets of the Vatican. Ooh. Now, PBS is one of the most respected news agencies in this country, in the world, right? Very, very good in the work that they do. And that documentary is fascinating. Watch that and be blown away. It's a, it's a documentary about the Vatican Bank. Ay, 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 ay. Candela keeps on saying and of her forehead a name was written mystery babylon the great the what the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth if she is a mother the mother harlot and she is the mother of harlots that means that she has daughters or she has others that are following in her adulterous way amen and that's what we started to do yesterday we started to break down and really understand well the question is who else is babylon who else is Babylon? Well, who is the mother? We don't have to go too far because we saw Benedict, October 31st, 2012. The Catechism of the Catholic Church clearly summarizes this. Faith is an ecclesial act. The faith of the church proceeds, engenders, supports, and nourishes our faith. The church is the mother of all Catholics. No, my loved ones. They believe that they are the mother of all. 
and that everybody has to render to her. They're not saying that outspokenly because they know, but that's what they're saying, and that's what they're going to continue to enforce and, and push. Now they don't even have to enforce it as they did. Now everybody's just basically melting in front of them, right? Everybody's just running to join this. It says here, the faith of millions, the credentials of Catholic religion, Reverend John Anthony O'Brien, that observance, talking about Sunday observance, remains as a reminder of the mother church from which the non-Catholic what? Sex broke away, like a boy running away from home but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. What are they saying? They're still, they're all, we're the mother church. Now they don't call them sex. Now they call them Christian communities, right? Christian communities because they say, you're not churches, you descend from us. We are the only church. That is the position that they have been held, holding on to. And we know, my loved ones, that we have talked about that. What is Babylon? Very simple. Babylon in the first instance is the coming together of all Christian churches. And then following the coming together of all Christian churches, there's going to be a push. And then what's going to happen? The coming together of all? All nations. One nation, one church. That is Babylon. That is what the Bible is telling us. The system that is going to rise up. And you say, well, that doesn't sound like something like that can happen. Keys of this blood, John Paul, John Paul II versus Russia and the West for Control of the New World Order. A book by Malachi Martin, who is a Jesuit priest, a Jesuit scholar. The goal of John Paul II, and I put there the papacy, is a geopolitical structure for the society of who? Involved, it's getting out of jurisdiction. The church has no place getting involved in any of this. Society of nations designed and maintained in accordance with the ethical and doctrinal outlines of Christianity as it is taught and propagated. Can't be propagated and taught by the Bible because the Bible in nowhere does it tell us to get involved in these things. It is what? By the Roman pontiff as the vicar of Christ, a vicarios filidei on earth. This is what they are pushing for. This is what they want. And the question is, how is this going to happen? How is this government, one world government going to start? It begins here. It begins with this fascinating and an interesting relationship that has been growing and strengthening in an enormous way between the United States of America and the, and the Vatican. Everybody with me? Our great country, as we saw. Right? And there you have... Uh, the, our current president with the current pope, it doesn't matter if it's Obama and Francis, it doesn't matter, right? You change them and switch them up, it's it continued consistently since Reagan and John Paul II. And this, is going, this has only been strengthened, but it's not just with the executive branch, it's also with the legislative branch. The people that make the laws in our country are also what? Are marveled with the beast. They are in love with the beast. The major leaders of our, of our legislative bodies, they are also Catholics. And you question, how is this going to happen? How are they? The Constitution is very clear. Well, we've already seen that since 9-11, the Constitution is kind of like, nah, you just put it to the side, it doesn't matter that much, right? It's not that bad. It's not really that important. And how is this going to happen in our legislative bodies that this is going to come across? It's through what? Religious pressure. Religious pressure is what's going to carry this along. Religious pressure from whom? From the Protestants here in the United States. And we've mentioned and told, and this is not nothing hidden. You're going to see it in the video how clear it is that already the Anglicans, the Methodists, the Lutherans, and almost all of the churches that came out of the Protestant Reformation have already all signed up to return to the mother. Let's come together as one agreement and let's form one church. Who's the only ones that are missing? Pentecostal, Evangelical, Charismatic churches and this is going to happen here in the united states my loved ones it is already happening and you're going to see that video how clear this is this is and this is nothing new right decree on ecumenism unitatis trading gratio second vatican council 1964 the restoration of unity among all catholics among all christians is one of the principal concerns of the Second Vatican Council. Christ the Lord founded one church and one church only, for it is only through Christ's Catholic Church, which is the all-embracing means of salvation. So, this is the push. This is nothing new, my loved ones. This has been happening since the 60s. That they, talking about the other Christian communities, or those that have Protestants, they can benefit fully from the means of salvation. So, we're getting salvation. Any salvation we're getting is through the Catholic Church. We believe that our Lord entrusted all the blessings of the New Covenant to the Apostolic College 
alone, of which Peter is the head in order to establish the one body of Christ on earth to which all should be fully incorporated who belong in any way to the people of God. You think I'm making this stuff up, right? Nope. This is, comes from their own documents, their own things. They're saying it outwardly. We want to all come together, one church, one unit. And how is all of this going to happen, my loved ones? How is this going to happen? Well, the push is to make Congress to pass laws that violate the separation of church and state. Things are going to get much worse and very quick. If you thought that 2008 with what happened with the markets, that was bad, Oh, we have no idea. The Bible tells us that things are going to get much worse. And as they get worse and things start to get really bad on all different levels, socially, politically, economically, there's going to be a push to what? To try to enforce religious tradition, to try to enforce religious principles. Now, I don't remember anywhere in the Bible where Jesus Christ ever forced anybody to follow him, right? It's not about that, and they're going to try to enforce it, and they're going to pass laws that break this, but the separation between church and state, as we're going to see when we talk about the mark of the beast. And what's going to happen, of course, they might do that, but then once it goes across the Supreme Court, they're going to they're gonna make it unconstitutional, right? No, because six of the nine justices of the Supreme Court are Catholic. They have already a supreme majority. They're not going to say it, and they've already expressed lots of them, right? That, no, you know. Sometimes they put other, uh, other concerns over uh, the constitutionally based of our country, which has separated church and state. This is my loved ones has happened, and this is going to happen. And this is when the United States is going to make the image to the beast. Why? Because the image of the beast is a reflection or resemblance of the beast. And what does the beast do? It brings church and state together. It doesn't separate them. Our loving country is going to do this, my loved ones. This is what prophecy is telling us, and we're going to see this play out in a fascinating way, especially when we talk about the mark of the beast. Is everybody with me? Amen? All right. So, as we continue this, the question is, who else is involved in Babylon? Because this is a world system, right? This is a world system. We know that the Vatican is involved. We know that the United States through Protestantism is involved in this. But the question is, who else is involved? How do we know who is part of Babylon? How do we know this? And well, the prophecy says that the woman should be what? She will be fornicating with the kings of the earth and there's going to be a wine. But later on it says that there are, she's producing what? In that golden cup. Abominations and filthiness, right? And we saw that that's what it sounds at uh, when it's written out in the Bible. But if we read it literally, it's Babylon the harlot and her daughters fornicate or commit adultery with the kings of the earth and out of this illicit relationship come wine abominations and filthiness that have the world what drunk if we would read that out how it reads out it's the vatican and her daughter churches are coming into and have come into covenants and alliances with nations and governments and based on this illicit relationship between church and state there are doctrines teachings and practices that will be enforced and that have been enforced in the past that have the world what confused and deceived in regards to the plan of salvation. Amen? The plan of salvation. And that was the purpose of the Reformation, to reform and restore those, the plan of salvation through the sanctuary. Amen? But the question that we are going to be answering as we continue is, what happened to the protest? It seems that the protest is over because those churches that were protesting are now what? Uniting. Ooh, so things have gotten very quickly changed around, but that's fine because God is in control, amen? God is in control. God is not going to leave. The, pro the protest is not over. Now, what is an abomination? We begin to see that in the Bible, an abomination in Hebrew is the word shakats, and it's used to talk about to be filthy, to loathe, to pollute, to abhor or something detestable. In Greek, it's the word bedluso, which means to stink, to be disgusted, something that God detests, abhor something that is abominable. God is clearly telling us that the abominations are things that God dislikes immensely. And we began to su study these abominations because the abominations will identify, identify the daughters of Babylon. They will identify who is following the mother. And we started off yesterday talking about the abomination of what? Of food. God says, you are my special people in Deuteronomy chapter 14. You are my special people. You are chosen. I have taken you. Be holy. Do not eat anything abominable, right? And we saw when we went to the list in Leviticus that it clearly says that 
pigs, hogs, swine are what? Are an abomination, right? What is it, that God has a chicken business and he, doesn't, well, he wants to make sure he doesn't have competition? No. Why is God asking us not to eat pork? Because he loves us. Amen? He loves us and our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and it's the worst. And this is not only God saying it, science has confirmed this. The worst type of meat that you can eat is pig meat, my loved ones. That is the worst. Yes, bacon is part of it. All of that, all of those pork sore sausages, that is the worst. God is telling us because he loves us. And any, not only that, he also spoke about the animals of the sea, right? Which we saw are related to the cockroach. As much as we love this, and I told you my testimony, I love this food. These two were my favorite foods. But when I come to the Bible and I say, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, I don't understand it, but I'm going to walk away. And we know now that these animals, well, I didn't know at the moment, but I know now that they're what? Scavengers, right? They're garbage disposals of the sea and the pig, right? And as I think the pastor told me a funny joke. He said, uh, stop eating my garbage disposals. That was pretty funny. I thought that was good, right? God is saying, don't eat them. I have them here to clean the stuff, and you're eating them, and you're eating the garbage that they're eating. Is everybody with me? Woo, this is tough stuff. I know this is tough, but when we come along these things, and some people have asked me, well, weren't, that, weren't those mosaic laws for the Jews? Well, God established the clean and unclean meat not with the Jews in, at the end of Genesis. He established it in creation. After creation, I'm sorry, what was the original diet? It was not meat. God did not create the animals for, to eat them, nor the animals ate themselves. That happened after when the flood came, God gave them the option. He said, I'm not the option. He said, you're going to have to eat this because you're going to be on the ark for a year and you're not going to be able to eat plants or food. So only eat the clean animals, right? That was established from the beginning. God gave them that permission to do that. But we know why were the pigs and only there in, in, in pairs? Because guess who was cleaning up all the garbage on the ark? It was those two pigs. So this is what God is trying to sell us. Amen? And, and, and I'm sorry. And, you know, if these animals were abominable thousands of years ago, imagine today. My loved ones, today not only pigs, but also what they do to chicken and to, and to cows, right? Which are clean animals in the biblical sense. But, but they're also injected with hormones and bam, bam, bull and all of this stuff and it's all of this is making us sick right and we advise right here at the Adventist church we teach the principle right of a vegan diet right a, a plant-based is the best way to go whole wheat as long as it's not GMOs and and a number of other things right because why because it's proven to be the best diet for the human being not only physically but also in our in our mind amen and these are tough choices, but these are things that we say, Lord, if you want me to be healthy, you want the Holy Spirit to be, guide me, Lord, and help me to walk away from those things. Amen? It's a process, my loved ones. Amen? I would immediately say stay away from the clean meat. And if you are going to eat, right, especially the white meats, chicken and, and turkey, please buy them cage-free, uh, fed with corn, no hormones. Amen? If you're, if you're making that process, getting away from the pork, it's getting away from the red meat too, right? It's proven that red meat is not good for us at all, right? And some people say, well, the proteins. You can get the same proteins without the bad effects, amen? But we should want to start moving away from these things and try to eat as healthy as possible. Can I hear an amen for that? Yeah. Amen. But the question then we have is, what are the other abominations? We know these abominations. I also sent you an article for those that I have the email called Hogs... Uh, and other hazards, right? Read it. It's very interesting. It talks about the clean and the unclean animals throughout the Bible. I invite you to study it. And like I said, I'm here. We'll continue to study and other things. Amen? We should want to take out of our lives those things that are harmful for us. Because guess what? The battle is for the mind. Whoever controls the mind controls you. The devil wants to control your mind. And one of the way he, way he controls your mind is by numbing it and making you numb to the things that are happening. And God wants our minds to be sharp, to be fresh, to be awake, amen? So that we can be a paper, we can understand his word, and we can live according to his word. Can I hear an amen for that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Go with me, please, to let's study tonight's abominations. Because I know you're excited and you want to see what's the next abomination, right? Deuteronomy chapter 18. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18. And let's study the next abomination. Everybody with me? So you go to Genesis, Exodus Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Is everybody there? 
And we're going to start on verse number 9. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 9. Our abomination for today. It says there, When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. Uh oh, it's going to get a little interesting here. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through fire. What? Well, that's literally, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. Or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, or the one that reads the palms, or the one that reads the ball, or the one that listens to the horoscope, or the one that you get the idea, right? Whoo! He continues to say, For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for these nations which you will dispossess. Listen to soothsayers and diviners, but as for you, the Lord God has not appointed such for you. God is very clear in his word, and he says, do not listen to people that talk to the dead, anybody that has anything to do with the dead, or spiritists, or mediums, or any of those things. And the question then becomes to be, why? Why is God telling us not to communicate with the dead? Why is God telling us not to have to do anything with anybody, not only that talks to the dead, but anybody that says that they can predict the future or knows the future or can tell you about your future or your past in that sense? God says don't have anything to do with these people. And the question we ask that we are going to answer tonight is why? Aren't our loved ones that have passed away watching over us, taking care of us, Walking us through these difficult events in our lives. Now, my loved ones, this appears to be the popular belief, popular culture in our times about the dead, that they are with us, helping us. But what we are going to see is that this is the perpetration of the greatest lie that was told from the Garden of Eden, and Babylon is preaching this lie. Amen? Now, what is that lie? What is that lie that the world has believed and that Babylon is preaching and that the devil said and that sadly, my loved ones, most Christians believe today. Most Christians have believed this lie. I believed it too until I was showed the truth. Amen? And what is that lie? Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely what? Die. Now, the word for die is the Hebrew word muth, which means to lose the breath of life. That's why it says in Genesis chapter 7, 21 to 23, in the context, all that had the breath of life in its nostrils, everything that it was in the dry land, what? Died. What happened to death? What is death defined in the Bible? Losing what? The breath of life. When you lose the breath of life, you are dead. And God said, you shall die on the day that you eat of it. Now, we know that Adam and Eve didn't die on that day. Why didn't they die? Because God changed his mind? No, they didn't die because who died in their place? The lamb. Amen? They were supposed to die. They were supposed to be ended with, but God was showing them the plan of salvation that who? That in the future, the real lamb was going to come, and it's thanks to him that you did not die because he is going to take your place. Amen? Now, God said, you shall die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. But God said, you shall surely die. And the question that I have for you today is, who said the truth and who is lying? The devil, what is he saying? God lied to you. He's lying to you. You're not going to die. You're going to live forever. You're going to be immortal. Don't worry about it. And they believed that lie, and that's why they did that. Is everybody with me? Now, before we study what death is and what happens when a person dies, first we need to understand and study what is life. Because by studying life and seeing what life is a, is a part of, it will easily show us what is death. Amen? And a lot of people have a lot of questions. What happens when a person dies? Do they go to heaven? Do they go to hell? Do they go to purgatory? Do they, where do they go? We're going to study this topic tonight. Amen? What happens when a human being dies? But before that, let's look at life in itself. Amen? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. How does it say? 
So the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a what? A living soul. Amen? Man became a living soul. Now I have a question. When God created Adam, before he created him, was Adam alive? No, he was dead, right? He didn't exist, nada. What does God take to create a human, a living human being? He took the dust from the ground, and what did he do? And the breath of life. And it says there that Adam became a what? A living soul or a living being or a living person. It doesn't say there that Adam has a soul. It says that Adam is a living soul. Amen? So to be alive, even when God put the dust together, the clay together, and he formed Adam's body, he was still dead. Right? God had to breathe life into him. And, and Adam woke up as a man, not as a baby. You don't have to walk around and go boo boo gaga. As a man, and he started to what? to think amen that's what it is a living soul is a living being a living human that is thinking it doesn't say once again that adam had a soul it says that with the coming together of these two elements adam became a living soul amen now that's what life is the life is clearly taught there the dust of ground plus coming together the breath of life now the word neshama is equal to a living soul, which is the nefash, right? The life, the being alive, the being conscious, the thinking, the rational mind, amen? Now, the word neshama is vitality, intellect. Nefesh is life, a thinking being. And the other word that is used in Hebrew is the word ruach, which means to be alive, a rational thinking being, amen? That is what it means to be a soul, to be alive, amen? To be a thinking conscious inside of what? Inside of a body, Amen? In the context of human beings, that's what we're created from these two elements. Now, if we look at in, in that version that we read, right? It says, and man became a living soul. More recent, more uh, contemporary Bible versions have fixed this mistake, and they've put what? A living being, a living man, a living person. Now, let's look through the Bible. Let's look through the Hebrew Scriptures and confirm this. Amen? Let's look through this and make sure that we are following Scripture. Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. But flesh with the what? With the life, that's the word nefesh, where the word soul was used. Breath with the life, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Amen? So once again, the soul is what? The life, the human being that is alive. Genesis chapter 12, verse 5. And Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the what? The souls, there's the word nefesh, that they had acquired in Haram, and they departed to go into what? Now, did Abraham walk around with a bunch of floating ghosts? Right? This concept of this, this floating soul that is, that is permeated, did he walk around with that? No, clearly not. Abraham was a rich man, right? And he had many servants. So who did he take up with him to the land of Canaan? His, the people that he was with. Look at a modern, a modern version say, And Abraham took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Aram. Amen? Here's another version, Genesis 14, 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the nefesh or the persons and take the goods to what? Take the goods to thyself. Is everybody with me? Now, this is my favorite one because this, in this verse that we're going to see now, it uses the word nefesh, which is the word for soul, living being, to be alive, and it uses it in three times in the same verse, and in the same verse using it three times, it explains it in three different ways. Remember we talked about the Hebrew mind is what? When you want to make something important, you want to make something come up, stick out, you repeat it. It's repetition. Holy, holy, holy. Amen. So Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to atone for your souls on the altar, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the person. So the word soul, the word flesh can mean life, soul, person, to be alive, amen, to be a thinking, rational being. It's never used in the context of this third 
ghostly element that a human being has inside that is floating around. And we're going to be talking about some of this. Where does this all come from? Hebrew. The Hebrew word nefesh or ruach is used to mean life, soul, person or persons, or spirit. It is the vital power or strength to operate in an inert body. This is what we're talking about. Even the word spirit, right? We're, we're, you see in the Bible where it's used, and it's not talking about this third element, this soul. The spirit is talking about the, the mind, amen? It's talking about the mind because we worship God with what? With our mind. And sometimes it refers to soul, spirit, and all of these concepts. But it's talking about the human life, the human experience. Look at this. Now, how about in the New Testament, Carlos? Let's confirm this in the New Testament. Acts chapter 7, verse 14. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him. Seventy-five what? Souls. Now, Joseph called his father and his father came. Did he come with 75 ghost or ghostly souls hanging around like that? No. 75 who? 75 people. 75 family members. Living people that are thinking, breathing, and alive. Amen? Matthew chapter 2, verse 20, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. Now, in, in Greek, the word is used as suke. That's the word that is used here in the word souls, right? The Greek word suke means soul, living being, living person to be alive. That's why it says here, for they are dead which sought the young child's what? Life. Once again, the word suke, right? The child's life. It says here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own what? Oh, there it is, Carlos. There it is. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The word suke. Now I'm going to tell you, what does the word suke mean? It means the life. The being, the rational thought, right? A person that is thinking. To be alive, it's a human being that is thinking. Now, what we'll do is we'll look at a parallel verse in Luke that is, has the same context, and look how it uses the same word, suke, but it uses a different word. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoever will lose his suke or life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gains the whole world and lose himself, his soul, his being, or be cast away? Is everybody saying? In, this, in Matthew 16, it uses the word soul for suke, but in Luke, it uses the word life himself, a living being. Is everybody with me? Now, the words soul and spirit are used 1,658 times in the Bible, but never... Never, never associated or used with conscious or immortal when it leaves the body or when someone dies. Is everybody following me? For example, you'll never find in the Bible where it says an immortal soul or an immortal spirit or a conscious soul or a conscious spirit when it means coming out of the body. So we have this popular belief that when a human being dies, if they die before their time, it wasn't their time yet, what happens? The soul has to hang out, right? It has to do a good deed, and once the soul then does, does a good deed, then it can rest. Have we heard this before? This is very popular in Spanish culture. That's what we're taught, right? Oh, and this is the common belief. But the Bible doesn't say that we have a soul. The Bible says that we, we are a living soul. We are, components, we are the components of two elements. The physical part that God has given us and the... That breath of life, that vitality, that energy, that awakeness that God gives us the capacity to, to think and to reason and to logic. And sometimes the Bible separates the logical, rational part of the mind and it separates the emotional, sentimental part, right? And sometimes it'll do that. But it's talking about the same thing because does the heart really, oh, my heart is, is, is sad. No, your heart is just pumping blood, right? It's talking about what? Your mind, right? He says, The mind, right? What about the thoughts of your heart? The, 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 does the heart think? No. It's talking about what? And sometimes the Bible will separate those two and talking about the rational, logical part and the emotional, sentimental part, but it's talking about the same thing. And my question then is when I'm studying this, and I'm, so where does this come in? How did this come into Christianity? This belief that the, that the soul is, this, the spirit is this third element that a human being has and that's floating around. It's very simple where it came from. Guess where it came from? Ah, the devil making war on God's people, right? 
It all starts in Babylon. This all starts in Babylon, my loved ones. Babylonian mythology is talking about the dead being alive and, and following. Then the Persians came along and conquered the Babylonians. And the Persians had their own mythology and their own beliefs. And it came together with the Babylonian mythology. Then the Greeks with their philosophy and, and all of their fancy thought works. Then they conquered the Persians. And guess what? All of those pagan mythology beliefs, then they combine with the philosophical beliefs of the Greeks and all of this stuff, and this just gets worse and worse. And then the Roman Empire comes and conquers the Greece, and guess what? All of it comes, and that is the culmination of all of this is in, in Rome, in the Roman Empire. And this is where all of this belief comes from. And you probably know these two Greek philosophers, some of the most famous, Socrates and Plato, and what was the common belief of the Greek philosophers? Every human being has a mortal body inhabited by an... This is what the Greeks taught. Now, what happened? The Greeks were conquered by the Romans, and all of this fancy philosophy and talk and mythology comes into the Roman Empire. And guess what? With time, all of these Greek philosophers and this Greek mentality turns into from the Roman Empire into the, to the Catholic Church. And this belief of the immortal soul comes inside creeping into Christian beliefs. Now, just to show one of the, the many that I can cite, this is a man called Tertullian. He is known as one of the founding fathers of the beliefs, doctrines in the Catholic Church. And his commentary on Matthew chapter 28, this is what he says. God does not say that he will destroy the soul, for the soul is what? immortal and cannot be destroyed once again this is greek mythology that has creeped inside of the church and now is part of the common christian belief that your soul is immortal and that it could never be destroyed now i'm going to tell you this this is all the beginning and the foundations of modern spiritualism and what are the two tenets of modern spiritualism first that life continues immediately after death. That is an inert, natural immortality of the human being. And number two, that the dead can communicate with the, with the living. That those that have passed away can communicate. My loved ones, this is the New Age movement. This is Egyptian paganism, Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Greek, and of course Roman, Vatican, and her, and her daughters teaching this. This belief. And you ask, why is this so important? Well, it's important because God has told us not to have anything to do with dead people or those that speak with the dead or those that is going on. Is everybody with me? Now, is the human being immortal? That is the question. And this is how we're going to answer this question in a fascinating way because you might say, well, you know, I don't agree with some of these, plans, some of these verses. That's perfect. Let's go back to the beginning. I'm going to have a question for you. When God created Adam... Was Adam immortal? Raise your hand if you think he was immortal. Look at you, look at you all tired. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll leave it. No, nobody raise hands. Was he immortal? Okay. Who thinks that he wasn't immortal? Oh, there's division in the camp. I like this. Some say yes, some say no. Now I'm going to make uh, say an even better question. Was Adam immortal in himself, inertly, naturally, or did his immortality depend on something? Oh, now the question changes, amen? Does the question change? What happened when God created Adam? Well, to do that, my loved ones, all we have to do is go back to Genesis chapter 3. Go with me, please. Go with me, please. Genesis chapter 3. I'm sorry, let's go to Genesis chapter 2 first. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. We're going to answer that question in a fascinating way. Is the human being immortal? Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. Everybody there? And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant for the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there were... Thousands of trees, maybe millions, but there were two specific trees. One tree was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the other tree was the tree of... I wonder what that tree was for. I wonder why God made a tree of life. I think the, the name of the tree is telling us it's giving what? It's giving life. Now, 
after Adam and Eve rebelled, right? They said they rebelled. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to go to verse number 22. After God clothed them, he says, very interesting, despite God forgiving their sins, right? They were still kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And the question is, why? Why were they taken out? Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and what? Ah. So the reason why Adam and Eve eventually died was because they ceased to do what? To eat from the tree of life. That means that the tree of life was a punishment, taking it away. Because let's, have, let's, answer, let's put this hypothetical situation. Let's say God says, you know, Adam, I, I've forgiven your sins. You've been covered with the, with the, with the skin of the lamb. But I'm going to take the tree of life away from you. Because sin has already uh, become part of your, your, your experience. And we need to take that, solve that situation before that happens. So I'm going to take the tree of life away from you. And what if Adam was already immortal? <laughs> That's nothing big. If you can take the tree of life away, it doesn't matter. I'm immortal. I'm going to live forever. This is proof that he wasn't immortal. That for Adam to continue to live forever, he had to continue to what? To eat of the tree of life. Therefore, the Lord sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherub at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard what? The way of the tree of of life. Why? Because if Adam and Eve, they already had sin inside, the virus, the cancer of selfishness was inside of them, and if they continued to eat of the tree of life, what would have happened to sin? It would have lasted forever. And God said, no, I have to solve this problem of sin that human beings that have come on the earth, and by doing that, I have to take away the tree of life so that they cannot continue to live. But the devil said, you're going to live forever. Don't worry about it. You're not going to die. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that there is no life outside of God. Amen? God gives life, so if you don't have God, it's taken away. So when you disobey God and you tell God, thank you for creating me, thank you for everything you do for me, but from this moment on, Lord, I want to do my own thing. I don't need you. I can declare what's good and evil, right? What does God do? He respects your decision because you've chosen not to have him as your God. You want to do your own thing. You want to be your own God, and God steps aside. But when God steps aside, guess what? Three things also step aside. His blessings, his protection, and life itself because he is the giver of life. There is no life outside of God. Amen? So Adam and Eve depended on that. To have life, they depended on continue of eating from the tree of life. Now, the Bible is very clear. There is only one immortal being in the universe. And who is that? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. The blessed and holy mighty one, the king of kings and lord of lords, who what? Who alone has immortality and dwells in what? In inapproachable life. God has certain attributes that are just belong to him. And immortality is one of them. But he does what? He shares his immortality or he shares life with who? With his creatures. But it is dependent upon who? Upon God giving it. Amen? And Adam and Eve would have continued and lived forever. They would have been immortal if they would have what? If they would have continued to eat from the tree of life. So the, the immortality of God is unconditional. But the immortality of human beings is conditional, based on what? Eating from the tree of life. Amen? Wow, look at what it says here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought what? Life and immortality to light through what? So if you have the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have abolished death. Death is no longer powerful over you, talking about the second death, not the one that we're talking about today, and has brought what? God then through Jesus Christ will give you life and immortality to light through the gospel. Amen? Once again, immortality is conditional. It's not a given to each human being. It's conditional about giving it, receiving it from God. Amen? Is everybody with me? Now, we've talked about life. Now let's talk about death. And we're talking about, be conscious, the first death. Because the Bible talks about two deaths. 
The first death happens to everybody. Why? Because nobody's eating from the tree of life, right? That first death happens to every single body. That's why everybody dies. All of the God's faithful, loyal men and women have died because that's just a human experience, right? But the question is then, what happens with that first death? What is that first death? Well, if we know what life is, then death is the opposite. And look at what it says here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. But by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall. So what's going to happen to the physical element of the human being, the dust? It's going to decompose, right? Just decompose. We'll return back to the earth. Ecclesiastics 12, 17. And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to who? To God who? The spirit, the life, through the breath of life. God is returning, and it's returning to God and that's why when you stop breathing, you die. You stop breathing, you die. Psalms 104, verses 29. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their the breath. They die and return to what? And return to dust. Look at what it says here in Acts chapter 5, verse 5 and 10. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and did what? Breathed his last death. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathe her last, her last, her last what? Her last breath. And the young men came and found her what? Dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. What is death? Death is when you breathe your last breath, expires, and what happens to the flesh? It decomposes and the breath of life goes back to where? To God who gave it. And what happens to us? Look at this, Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. But Jesus, when he cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up what? His spirit. Some people say, there it is, there's the spirit, the ghost. Well, then it says in Mark chapter 15, a parallel verse, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and expired. Some people say when Jesus Christ died, he, 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 his spirit went up to the Father. Interesting, because when Jesus Christ resurrected, Mary went to touch him. He said, don't touch me yet. I have not ascended to my Father. What was Jesus doing, my loved ones? Jesus was dead. Jesus died. He stopped breathing. This is the, it's hard for us to understand that Jesus Christ stopped breathing. He was dead. Now, to understand this uh, concept of death a little bit better, we're going to look at a couple of verses now. But I have a question. When you die, where do you go? Do you go to heaven? Do you go to hell? Do you go to purgatory? It's like a lobby. It's like a waiting room, right? That's what purgatory is. Is any of this biblical? Where do you go when you die? John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this hour. The hour is coming when who? All who are where? Shall hear his voice. They have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of what? My loved ones, how many resurrections are there? Two resurrections. The resurrection of the living, the ones that died in Christ, Amen. And the resurrection of those that are condemned, that are lost. There are two resurrections. And when we study the topic of the millennium, we're going to see that that first resurrection is at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the second resurrection, or the resurrection of the dead, and the ones that died without Christ, they're going to be resurrected at the end of the millennium. To what? To receive their sentence. Ooh, it's going to get juicy, my loved ones. Is everybody with me? Now, it clearly states, as Jesus Christ says, that when he comes, how many are going to hear? All who are where? In the graves. Now, does it make sense, my loved ones? Does it make sense that if you are in heaven or you are in hell, right? And Jesus Christ comes and he calls and you're resurrected. And then you're going to be sent right back down there or back, sent up to heaven. Does it make sense? I'm in heaven, and then he says, well, I'm going to come. Everybody go into the graves. I'm going to come and pick you up. Does that make sense? Well, this is why it gets very interesting. Let's, live, let's let Jesus tell us what that first death is. Amen? Let's let Jesus explain what death is. Go with me, please, in your Bibles to John chapter 11. Go with me, please, to the Bible to John chapter 11. This is the story of Lazarus, and this story clears up a lot of issues. John chapter 11, 
Are we having fun? I was really tired last night. You have no idea. Not because, I, because my computer tightened up. And just when I thought I was good and I'm going to have at least an hour of rest, oh, I can't. Uh. So I did get a little, I was a little dragging at the end. Now I'm not exercising. Especially after I got a good meal, amen? John chapter 11, verse number 11. It says, these things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus, what? Sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Oh, he's sleeping, he's fine, he just needs a nap. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he will get well. Don't worry about it, he's just having a nap, he's sleeping. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Amen? Now, Jesus Christ compares death, the first death, to what? To sleep. And the question is why? Two reasons, very simple. Two reasons. Why does Jesus make a comparison to the first death, the death that all human beings have to suffer on this earth? Why does he call it sleep? Well, very simple. When you sleep, you are unconscious, right? You're not conscious. You go to bed, let's say you go to bed at, I don't know, 10 o'clock, and then you wake up maybe, and then you're like, oh, it's already time to go to work. What else? Time flies. You did not know what happened during those. I'm the type of person that when I sleep, you can have a hurricane, you can have any, and I'm, I'm out. I'm out, and I thank the Lord for sleeping like that, amen? I, am, I don't know anything. I just wait. I even go to the bathroom and don't even remember when I go to the bathroom and come back. And my wife is like, you did this last night. I said, I did what? Yeah, you stood up and you started talking. You just went all over the place and then you came back to bed. And I'm like, why? Because I was, I was asleep. I was unconscious. I was not aware of my thoughts. Amen? So first we know one thing about that first death is that you are unconscious. You are not aware. Just as the same way when you wake up and six, eight hours have passed, that's exactly how it's going to be for those people that have died. They're going to wake up and be like, oh, what happened? Just like that. Now, the other reason is why. It was, I just said it right now. When you sleep, you are going to, in some point, wake up. So everybody's sleeping. That means everybody that has died is unconscious, and they are going to wake up one day. Some in the resurrection of, them, of the damned and condemned. Some in the resurrection of, the, of the, the ones that lived in Christ. Amen? Now, if you are in the resurrection and you wake up, and you still got that backache, you still need your glasses, you still need your fake teeth, you still have all of these issues. Oh, my toe, my back. Oh, this is a, I'm a mess. Oh, you're in the wrong resurrection. <laughs> we don't want to be in that resurrection. Amen? Now, what does the Bible say about that sleep? Go with me, please, to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. If you open to Psalms, right? After you go by Psalms, you're going to go by Proverbs. And after Proverbs, you're going to come across the book of Ecclesiastes. This is fascinating. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5 and 6. Amen? It says here, 5. Ecclesiastes, after the book of Psalms, come Proverbs, and then comes the book of Ecclesiastes. Psalms is in the middle of the Bible. Amen? It says... For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nada. And they have no more reward. For their memory, the memory of them is what? Is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. The Bible clearly states that when you die, you are what? You are unconscious. You are not aware. All that hate or love, whatever it is is not available because you're unconscious. And look at what it says in verse number 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Why? Because the dead are unconscious. If Lazarus, for example, would have been in heaven, and when Jesus Christ resurrects him, Lazarus would have come out, taking off the band, he was like, dude, what's up? I was up there, I was having so much fun, it was great, why would you bring me back? Vice versa, if he would have been in hell, burning and torching, he would have, whoo, Jesus, it was so hot up there. Thank you, you had a cup of water? He didn't say anything, you know why? 
And not only him, nobody. The Bible talks about 12 resurrections, and none of them say anything about death because they were unconscious. Amen? The Bible clearly teaches that. They had nothing in their head. Look at what Acts chapter 7, verse 59 and 60 says. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my what? There it is. He's receiving the Spirit. No. It's the breath of life. It's his life left him. And then what happened? Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge me with them with the sin, as Jesus said. And at, when he had said this, he what? He fell asleep. Amen? He was unconscious. That's it. He falls asleep. Psalms 146, verse 3 and 4. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth. He returns to the earth. In that very day, what? His thoughts perish. Amen? It's very clear what happens. The breath of life goes back to God. The flesh decomposes. And that very day, your thoughts are done away with. That's what Ecclesiastes says. You're not thinking. You're not feeling nothing because you're unconscious. You're asleep. Psalms chapter 6, verse 5. Return, O Lord, deliver me. O save me from your mercy's sake. For in death there is no what? No remembrance of you in the grave who will give you praise. Nobody can because the dead are what? Sleeping. The dead people are not praising God and they're not doing back, forth, or either or. They're sleeping. I love this verse. This verse is a boo. Job chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave, what? Does not come up. He shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. Amen? It's clearly stating that when you die and you go down to the grave, that's it. You're not going to be hanging out in your home and walking around. Now, this is very personal, amen? This is a very personal thing. Because some people believe that what? That their loved ones have come to visit them, that they're nurturing them and teaching them and coaching them along different things. But the Bible says that the dead know nothing. There's no thought. There's no remembrance. They do not return to their house. Why? Because the day that they resurrected, all of this is going to be done away with. Amen? That's why it's saying it. No, of course not. It's not until the resurrection that you will be conscious again. And look at what Acts chapter 2, verse 29 and 34 says. Brothers, the patriarch David, I can say confidently, that died and was buried, and his tomb is with us unto this day. For David has not what? Ah. Now, the Bible says that when Jesus Christ was resurrected, there was a group of people that resurrected with him. And I would have thought that if any of those people would have been resurrected with him, it would have been David. And yet, they say in the book of Acts, David did not ascend to heaven. David is what? He is sleeping. He is on his grave. Amen? Now, what are we looking at? What are we seeing? Do you die? Do you go to heaven when you die? Do you go to hell when you die? No. You're asleep. That's it. You're done with. Amen? This is what the Bible is clearly trying to teach us. Now, there are only four people in heaven that we know of. Amen? Biblically founded that we can say with accuracy. Of course, Jesus, who's in the Holy of Holies with the Father, right? But also in heaven, not in the sanctuary, but in heaven, you have Enoch, Elijah, and Moses. That's it. Now, we know that there's another group that resurrected with him, but what happens? We can't say with any accuracy who they are because the Bible doesn't confirm it to us, amen? And if we are going to say that they're in heaven, first of all, they have to be from the group of people that resurrected when Christ resurrected. So, can Mary be in heaven? There's no way to biblically confirm any of that. She died after the fact, amen? So, all we know is those three people along with Jesus that are in heaven. Is everybody with me? Amen? Now, praise the Lord for this teaching. You know why? Because there's nobody right now being tortured or suffering the pain and being just beaten down in heaven, amen? And at the same time, there's nobody in heaven, except the people that we know, right? Everybody else is sleeping. And this brings comfort because some people, especially during the, mid the dark ages, right? They were told that mothers, are, oh, my son died and he wasn't, he didn't, oh, he's, gonna, he's burning in hell right now. How could you live in any comfort knowing that maybe this person was a very bad person and despite that, oh, they're being tortured right now. I mean, especially from a mother perspective, right? I don't know that perspective, but I can imagine. You can't sleep at night knowing that your son or your daughter is being 
it, it tormented in this place of this hellfire? Is everybody with me? Amen? And, and you notice how people always say, especially athletes, right? I've seen this a lot. They say, well, my brother was with me. My brother passed away and he was with me. He helped me through this. Or, or my mother or my grandfather. And I said, that's interesting because they never say anything when they fail and lose. They never say, well, grandma wasn't around. She wasn't helping me. What happened? Where was my brother? He wasn't with me today. It's always when things are good, never when things are bad. Amen? And this is the situation that you start making. I've gone to funerals sometimes, and you know, you've been to these funerals. You go to a funeral, and, 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 and the minister is speaking, and he says, whoa, whoa, uh, so-and-so is, is, is resting in peace, right? They're resting in peace, and that's good. That's biblical. Amen? He's resting in peace. And they say, he's up in heaven shining down and looking upon us. And I'm thinking, is he, is he up there or is he here? What, what's going on? It's contradicting, right? It's contradicting. The Bible is very clear. When you die, you are asleep. That is it. No more, no mass. Now, the question that we have to ask is, why is it an abomination? Why is God telling us, please do not have anything to do with the people that are dead. Please do not have anything to do with people that spark, speak with dead people or that people that, speak with, that think they know the future or any of those because those that speak to the future generally get their ideas from guess who? Right? There are other ones that they just don't know what they're talking about. But that, now why does God tell us not to pay attention to any of this? Very simple, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 and 7. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man, and whose flesh is flesh, and whose heart departs from the Lord. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in who? In the Lord. What's happening is that people are listening to these spirits, to these ghosts, to these dead people, Right? And they're listening, and they should not be listening to them. They should be listening to what? To the word of God. God says, don't trust in them. Don't trust in those people that they say they know the future. They don't know anything. I'm the only one. Remember what he says in Isaiah chapter 46? I am God, and there is no one like me because I am the only one that knows the future. And I told it from you from the past. I told you about these things. Don't pay attention to these things. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. And when they say to you, inquire of the medians and of the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? God is saying, why? Don't listen to those people. They're an abomination because they're listening to, guess what? Deceiving spirits. Why does God tell us not to pay attention? My loved ones, I'm telling you because this is out of family experience. That they had, oh, grandpa came. Then I'm like, what? The Bible doesn't teach that. Of course, I didn't tell my mother that because she would have beaten me to the floor. <laughs> she wasn't ready for that yet. I was aware of these things, but I was like, what? You know why? Clearly, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. Now, the Spirit expressively says that in the end times, some will abandon the faith and follow what? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Revelation chapter 16, verse 4 says what? For they are spirits of what? Of demons performing miracles. My loved ones, those are not our loved ones because the Bible says that the dead are asleep. Those are demons, fallen angels, masquerading as our loved ones. And what they're doing is exactly that. They're deceiving and people, oh, I heard the spirit. I heard the spirit. I wonder what spirit you heard because the Bible clearly says that there are both spirits of God and spirits of the enemy. And you have to test those spirits based on what? Do what they're saying go with scripture. If it's not based on the, on the, on the testimony and on, on the prophets and on the law, then it's not coming from God. It's coming from the devil. And this is one of the big tricks we're going to see when we talk about Armageddon. One of the big deceiving tools that the devil is using is that you have so many Christians now what? Caught up into this spiritualism, into this all of this occult stuff. Talking with the dead and praying to the dead and the bread talking to you. And God is clearly telling us, don't pay attention. Amen? God wants us to know. God wants us to be secure. The dead are asleep, my loved ones. Amen? The dead know nothing. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, let your heart not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many what? Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, his second coming, and receive you to myself in the clouds that where I am, you may also, what is he saying? I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come get you, and then I'm going to take you to that place. Amen? That's the millennium, my loved ones. 
And that's what we're going to be studying in upcoming topics. Jesus Christ says, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have what? Everlasting life. And I will raise him up. When? On the last day. Amen? Jesus Christ is going to give us the gift. Jesus Christ is going to return and give us that gift because all that believe in him will receive what? Everlasting life. That means that those that have died without Christ, they're going to have everlasting death. Ah. Now, somebody will ask me, well, wait a minute. How, how is he going to give us everlasting life if, this, if it was the beginning, there was a tree of life, but that tree of life was taken away, it was destroyed after the flood, Right? How is then we're going to return God going to give us immortality again through the tree of life? You ready? Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth. Are we in the new heavens and the new earth? No, not yet. That's coming. We're still in the old same earth. Which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord. And it shall come to pass from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath. All flesh shall come to worship before me. Now we know why all flesh is going to come to worship Sabbath to Sabbath as a commemoration of God's creation, of redemption, of sanctification. Amen? That's never changed. But why from month to month? Why are we going to return to God every month to worship him? Go with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. This is juicy stuff. We know that from Sabbath to Sabbath, it was established in creation, and it shall be for all eternity. Revelation chapter 21. Everybody there? Verse number one. Now I saw a new what? A new heavens and a new? Isn't that the promise in Isaiah? Amen? Go to jump to chapter 22, because we're at 21 and 22 talk about this. 22 says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street was what? On either side of the river was what? Ay, 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 ay. Which bore what? Twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit what? I didn't hear an amen for that. Praise the Lord. Why are we going to go up every Sabbath and every month? Because every month we're going to be eating from what? From the tree of life. Amen. And it's going to be a new fruit every month. And every month we're going to come back. And that's going to be the tree of life is like a battery recharger. Amen. And that's what we're going to be doing. Every month we're going to be eating from the tree of life. Why? Getting, receiving God's immortality because we have been given the ultimate reward to be restored back into the presence of the Father, into the presence of God. And one of the gifts of, say, of salvation is eating from the tree of life again. Amen? That means that those people that have not been saved cannot live forever because they what? They're not eating from the tree of life, which is dependent, it's conditioned to be to live forever. Can I hear an amen? Praise the Lord, and that's what God wants to know us. And what's going to happen on that fabulous day when Christ returns? What is going to be of that fabulous day? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last what? Ba -ba -ba! For the... put on immortality so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory where all death is your sting where all death is your victory but thanks be to God which gives us the victory through who through our Lord Jesus Christ amen no more when Jesus Christ returns new bodies in your mind no your mind has to be prepared here for that great day. But God is going to give us a new body. No more doctors. No more cancer. No more pain. No more backaches. No more falling teeth. No more none of that. Amen? That's it. We're going to receive a new body. You're going to be 22 for the rest of your life. For the rest of eternity. Praise the Lord. None of that stuff. That is the gift that God has for all of us. Amen? And God is telling you. God is telling you today, my loved ones. That is my plan of salvation. My plan of salvation is to give you this gift. To give you that. And it doesn't matter what physical condition God is going to give us on that great day. Amen? And Jesus Christ returns. And you're going to see, oh, all of this is going to just change miraculously. And we're going to have a new body. Amen? 
If you're missing anything, it'll be restored, amen, and better than what you had originally. And that's what God has for us. But my loved ones, we have to what? Revelation 18, verse 3 through 4. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Come out of her who? Lest you take part in her sins and lest you share in what? In her plagues. My loved one, Babylon teaches that the soul is immortal. That that soul, this third element, is going to last forever and ever and ever. And of course, if you're saved, then you have to go to heaven, right? But if you're lost and you are immortal, then they have to put you someplace. That's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Amen? That's the second death. What is that second death? We'll study it in depth today, but today I want to teach you. Babylon is teaching that the soul is immortal. That you're going to live forever and ever and ever and ever in one of the two, if, even if you're not saved. And... That you can speak and somehow communicate with those that have died and those that have passed on. Is everybody with me? But Jesus Christ tells you tonight. John eleven twenty five 25 and 26. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen? He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall what? Never die. Do you believe this? And I ask you tonight, do you believe this? That when Christ returns, you will be resurrected if you just happen to be not alive on that moment. Amen. And do you want to be prepared for that great day when Christ returns? We don't have to be afraid of that first death because Christ says, if you're with me and you're in me, I will resurrect you to a new everlasting life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Who wants to be prepared for that great day? Stand up if you want to be aware and ready for the Lord when he returns on that great day because Christ is going to return. Amen. Christ is going to return, and he is going to bring those with him. No more corruption, no more death, no more sicknesses, none of that. Christ is going to give us an amazing eternity, more importantly, with him. Amen? Praise the Lord. God bless. All the glory for God. Amen? Tomorrow at 7 o'clock, Revelations what? Lake of eternal fire. Tomorrow we're going to study the second death. Because Revelation talks about a place of fire where they're going to be thrown in. We're going to study this tomorrow and see what does the Bible have to say about this. Tonight you're going to take the study guide. Are the dead what? Really dead. That's tonight's study guide. I'm going to send you notes. I'm going to send you a bunch of other fun little, I'm sending you articles and a bunch of things so you can really study and get this. There are some verses, my loved ones, that appear to say something else. But remember, what do we do? We, we weigh context and we weigh well, the Bible is clearly on this. Then you have two or three verses that kind of say something. What do we do? We study and we understand and God is going to, because God does not contradict himself. Amen? Praise the Lord. The Bible is very clear. Jesus Christ is going to come to resurrect that those have, that have died with him. Amen? And there's a promise that I never want you to forget when you walk out of here. What's that promise? Amen. And what is Isaiah 41, 10 and 10? Do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will always help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Who wants to make that promise theirs? Who wants to be able to say that to God and say, Lord, you promised you would help me. Please do. And God says, yes. For that, we have to do something else before. We have to do what? Matthew 6, Seek what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be given to you. Amen? Make Christ first. Wake up in the morning. Spend time with him, praying, studying his word. Then with your wife, with your children, spend time together in the Word at some point in the day. Make your house a sanctuary. Make your house a dwelling place for God. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Ken to come pray for us. And I want to see you all tomorrow night. Amen? Amen. Tomorrow, you've got to bring somebody. Remember, we still have gifts for anybody. I know we have, I think, a tumbleweed gets a gift because he brought a guest, right? So and somebody else, if you brought a guest, please let us know because we're going to keep on giving those out. Amen? Thank you for coming out. God bless you.